So my name's Chris Dowling. I'm a Principal Research Analyst with the Australian Institute of Criminology. Um, and today I'll be discussing some of the research that we've been undertaking here at the AIC um, into the criminal activities of outlaw motorcycle gangs in Australia. Um, specifically, I'll be presenting the findings of some research that um, my colleagues and I in the uh, Institute's Serious and Organised Crime Research Laboratory um, have undertaken to really improve our empirical understanding um, of the offending um, of these gangs and their members, um, and I guess to use this to inform Australia's response. So outlaw motorcycle gangs have a, a, an interesting and somewhat colourful history. They come from the United States originally um, in the, the 1940s, 1950s, and they emerged as countercultural groups um, of primarily returned servicemen um, who wanted to create a life outside of society um, and society's norms. So many of them were fresh from the, uh, the thrills and dangers of combat zones around the world, um, and they were attracted to a lifestyle characterised by uh, violence, uh, recklessness and rebellion. Now, given the pseudo-military origins of these groups, they also inherited a strong sense of camaraderie and loyalty, um, along with a set of uh, quite rigid rules and hierarchical structures. So even though these gangs are typically uh, organised into um, uh, relatively devolved and semi-independent branches or, or chapters as they're commonly known. Um, they're quite strictly controlled um, by, a, 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 I guess, a cadre of um, uh, senior members who act in a number of executive roles, such as presidents, vice presidents, sergeants at arms and so on. Now, given the, the countercultural and, and rebellious um, philosophies underpinning the founding of these gangs, um, it, it's only natural that they, they soon became synonymous with crime. Um, and members uh, have indeed been found to, to commonly engage in various forms of um, uh, lower level offending, such as uh, common assault, um, drugs and weapons possession, um, uh, traffic violations um, and, and general disorderly conduct. However, in Australia, they have more recently um, been subjected to an intensified focus by law enforcement um, as evidence emerges of their more widespread and systematic involvement in various forms of uh, more serious and, and in particular uh, organised forms of crime. Um, now, this evidence is becoming increasingly prevalent um, in the public sphere as the media focuses on an increasing number of high profile cases of OMCG involvement in uh, various forms of um, organised crime. And in addition to this, there's Australian research that draws largely on this publicly available information, uh, which has attempted to understand more about the criminal activity of OMCGs in Australia. Now, this information and this research has collectively given us some interesting insights into OMCGs and the nature of their offending, but the picture they give us is really piecemeal and incomplete. So they don't provide a comprehensive or national picture um, of the, uh, the criminal activity of OMCGs uh, in Australia. And they don't really allow us to answer basic questions about the extent to which um, gang members are, are committing crime, um, including serious and organised crime. So um, with this in mind, uh, my team in the, the Serious and Organised Crime uh, Research Laboratory um, are currently undertaking a program of research on um, the criminal activity of outlaw uh, motorcycle gangs uh, in Australia. Um, and it's really characterised by two aims. So the first of these aims is to better understand the patterns of offending um, among OMCGs, including the extent to which they engage in different forms of crime, um, how they engage in these forms of crime, the spatial patterns in their offending across the country and also trends in their offending over time. Um, and we're really undertaking this, this research to, um, I guess, achieve the second of our aims, which is to inform and, and evaluate um, uh, Australia's responses to, to OMCGs. So in service of the first of these aims, um, uh, the, a number of studies that we've undertaken as part of this research program have, have really focused on adding to what we know about the criminal activity um, of OMCGs and their members in Australia and, and really building that, that comprehensive national picture of their criminal activity that, that until now has been lacking. So the studies I'll be discussing um, today are published uh, through the AIC's Trends and Issues uh, series of reports and they're either currently available or will soon be available um, on the AIC's website and I've provided the URL there. Um, now importantly, um, before I embark further on this presentation, um, uh, I just would like to say that this work represents the um, significant efforts of not just myself, um, but my colleagues in the Serious and Organised Crime uh, Research Laboratory. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge them and express my gratitude to them for allowing me to discuss um, their research alongside my own today. 
Now, to enhance our understanding of the, the criminal activity of OMCGs in Australia, our research has drawn on information from uh, two databases uh, held by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. Um, the first of these is the National Gangs List, or the NGL. So the NGL is a comprehensive, uh, up-to-date and nationally agreed upon list of all OMCG members, uh, chapters and gangs in Australia. Um, now, while the ACIC are the custodians of this database and, and uh, uh, the managers of the information, the information itself comes from uh, the states and territories um, who are responsible for um, inputting this information, ensuring that it's updated and um, monitoring the number of uh, members and gangs in their jurisdictions. The second source of information that this research draws on is the National Police Reference System. So the, N uh, the National Police Reference System, or the NPRS, um, holds current and detailed um, national police information um, that operational police can draw on throughout the course of their duties. And critical for our purposes, it includes the apprehension histories of um, all, all persons of interest that operational police come into contact with. So the ACIC um, have very generously linked, de-identified and, and provided this data to the AIC for research purposes. And it's essentially given us a data set specifying the criminal histories of all OMCG members uh, in Australia as of early 2018. Um, and it's this data set that we've used to undertake the research that I'll be presenting today. Um, so after some initial screening and cleaning of the data, um, the data set contains information on over 5,500 OMCG members across 475 chapters and 39 gangs. Um, around a fifth of these, of these members were um, what are called nominees or probationary members who haven't yet earned their gang patches and become full members. Um, and of those full members in our data set, 12% um, uh, are also office bearers. So they're members who, who um, occupy some executive role of authority like a president or a sergeant at arms. Now, importantly, after the exclusion of minor traffic offences such as speeding, parking and pedestrian offences, um, these uh, OMCG members collectively um, were responsible for over 121,000 offences between 1990 and um, early 2018. Now, this is a significant number of offences, but let's delve a little deeper. So how common is crime among OMCG members? Um, so plotted here is the, the proportion of all OMCG members who have um, different kinds of offences uh, recorded. And we've split this into um, the proportion of OMCG members who have uh, recent offences recorded, so offences that occurred um, uh, in the last five years, and um, uh, the proportion of OMCG members who have offences recorded across the entire observation period, so between 1990 um, and early 2018. Um, so looking at the uh, figures there on the left of the graph, we can see that um, of the 5,500 or so OMCG members that we examined, 50% had an offence of any kind recorded in the last five years, and 81%, so about four-fifths, um, had an offence recorded um, across the entire observation period. Now, moving to the right of that graph, um, turning to uh, violence and intimidation offences, which are basically offences that involve the threatened, attempted or actual use of violence, we can see that about a quarter of the OMCG members that we examined um, had one of these offences recorded recently, and about half had them recorded across the entire observation period. So there's a significant amount of violence um, among these OMCG members. Um, Short-term instrumental offending was also relatively common. So these are basically low-level uh, low theft offences. Um, so about, uh, or a little under a fifth of um, OMCG members had these offences recorded recently and a little under half had them recorded um, across the entire observation period. Now importantly turning to, to more organised crime related offences, um, we'll look first at the ongoing criminal enterprise um, offences there. These are offences that essentially involve uh, commercial supply or manufacture of drugs and other illicit, and other illicit commodities. Um, along with significant financial and regulatory offences such as money laundering. So you can see that um, in the last five years, 13% uh, of OMCG members had at least one of these offences recorded and around a third had them um, recorded across the entire observation period. And then if we separate out drug supply offences from that broader subset of uh, ongoing criminal enterprise offences, we can see that about 10% um, had these offences recorded recently and uh, a quarter had them recorded across the entire observation period. Um, now those figures on their own might look substantial, um, but let's give them a little context. So I've provided some points of comparison here um, just to, I guess, situate um, the, the prevalence rates that we're seeing in, um, in OMCG members. 
Um, now, there's a number of international studies that, that have undertaken similar research on the OMCG members um, in, in their jurisdictions, um, specifically research in Canada and certain European countries. And their findings are largely similar to, the, to our own. So they found that between 70 and 90% of the OMCG members that they examined um, had at least one recorded offence. Um, and if you remember back to the previous slide, you'll um, see that our figure of 81% sits almost exactly in between that. Um, now, turning now to other populations um, of, of offenders and non-offenders, um, the AIC undertook some research uh, a little while ago comparing an, a sample of Australian OMCG members um, with a, a, a much larger sample of um, uh, other organised crime associates. And it found that between the ages of 20 and 40, um, OMCG members uh, were significantly more likely to have uh, uh, an offence recorded of any kind than these other organised crime associates. And when we look at violent offending specifically, it found that OMCG members were over twice as likely um, to have uh, offences recorded across that period um, as organised crime associates. Now, in terms of how this compares to the general population, we turn to some research undertaken recently by Weatherburn and Ramsey, who followed a birth cohort of uh, New South Wales men who were born in 1984 um, up to the age of 33 um, and looked at their offending. And it found that 33% uh, of these men had at least one offence recorded between the ages of 10 and 33. Now, the OMCG members that we look at are obviously of, of, of different ages and were followed for different periods of time. So the results, or rather the samples aren't um, exactly comparable, but this is still a significant difference and it draws our attention to, um, to really how criminal um, uh, the, the population of OMCG members in Australia is. Um, so there's a perception that OMCGs uh, have become increasingly criminal over time and, and this is supported in some recent Australian, res Australian research uh, which points to an increasing number of younger, more violent and criminally inclined men um, who are gravitating towards these gangs more and more. Um, so we decided to examine this by looking at the early life offending profiles of uh, OMCG members. Um, and so we did this by basically taking the, the OMCG members that we were examining and splitting them into three birth cohorts. So the older cohort um, consist consisted of members born between 1979 and 1983. Um, the middle-aged cohort, um, consisting of members born between 1984 and 1988, um, and the younger cohort, uh, who were born between uh, 1989 and 1993. And we compared the early life um, uh, offending of these three cohorts, so essentially looked at their offending between the ages of 12 and 24. So plotted here is the cumulative prevalence of um, uh, any recorded offending and violent recorded offending for these three birth cohorts between the ages of uh, 12 and 24. And if we look at the figures there at age 24, we see that um, in the older cohort, uh, or sorry, in the younger cohort, um, almost 90% um, had at least one recorded offence uh, by the age of 24. And this compares to um, about three quarters of the middle age cohort and around about two thirds of the, um, of, uh, sorry, uh, three quarters of the middle age cohort and two thirds of the older cohort. Um, now, crucially, if we look to violent offending specifically, we can see that by the age of 24, 58% of uh, younger members uh, had at least one violent offence recorded by the age of 24. Um, this compares with a little under half of the middle age cohort and um, uh, significantly uh, around about a third of the older cohorts. So really what these findings are showing us is that um, uh, younger members are, are, I guess, coming into these gangs with, um, I guess, a uh, more of a history of offending. They're, they're offending more earlier in their life and they're offending earlier in their life. Um, and this in turn tells us that, that the younger members who are joining these gangs have a, um, or are likely to have a stronger uh, proclivity for, for crime and especially for violence um, than the, the middle-aged and older members. Um, now we've looked at offending overall in our sample, but are all members the same in terms of, of their offending? So one way to answer this question is to look at the concentration of offending among OMCG members. So concentration in this context means that a small number of individuals are, are, are committing a, a disproportionate amount of the, of the offences um, attributable to this population. Um, now, we wanted to look at concentration in terms of both the number or frequency of offences um, and also the harm of these offences. So to measure the harm of these offences, we use the Western Australian Crime Harm Index. Um, so this is an index that basically assigns a score to different offence types based on the amount of harm that those offences are estimated to cause. 
Um, and this is derived from uh, median penalties that perpetrators of these offences um, receive in Australia. Um, so essentially offence types with, with higher harm scores are estimated to cause um, more harm than other offences. And the, the highest ranking um, offences on this index are, are homicide and other serious forms of assault. Um, now we used what's called a, a Lorenz curve here to examine the concentration of offences and offence related harm among OMCG members in Australia. So a Lorenz curve basically plots the distribution of offences um, and offence related harm across OMCG members. So if there were no concentration um, in our data, the, the, the data would basically follow that dotted line down the middle there, which is also known as the line of equality. Um, so if you compare the y and x axes, uh, axes along that line, um, for example, you'd see that 10% that of members are accounting for 10% of offences or harm. So this would indicate no concentration. But as you can see there, our data deviates substantially from this line, which indicates a significant degree of concentration. So specifically, our data show that 5% of OMCG members in Australia account for 42% of all recent offences, so offences recorded within the last five years, and 70% of the harm caused by these offences. So in other words, what this is showing us is that there are a small number of very prolific OMCG members in Australia who are responsible for most of the crime and most of the harm attributable to this population. Um, now, finally, one of the concerns uh, regarding OMCGs in Australia is that their offending is, is thought to be highly mobile um, and, and that members are thought to offend across multiple jurisdictions. Now, this creates problems for Australia's jurisdictionally bound policing agencies um, and really highlights the pressing need for national coordination in how we respond to OMCGs. Um, now, the research we've done examining this broadly has found that around one in 10 OMCG members in Australia have offences recorded outside of the state or territory in which they're based, um, which we took as our, um, our measure of mobility. And when we look at the trends in mobility um, across, across different jurisdictions, we see some interesting patterns emerge. So generally speaking, when we, when we look at the proportion of criminally active OMCGs based in each jurisdiction who have offended outside of that jurisdiction, we can see that in certain smaller or less populous jurisdictions like the ACT or, ne nor or the Northern Territory, there's a large proportion of OMCG members here who have offended outside of those jurisdictions. Um, and then if we look at where these individuals are going to offend, um, turning to the figure on the right there, um, we can see that, that, the, um, that the, the most popular destinations for these criminally mobile members are basically the, the larger or more populous East Coast jurisdictions of Queensland and New South Wales. So this indicates some movement among um, OMCGs from smaller or less populous jurisdictions to larger, more populous East Coast jurisdictions, um, uh, uh, potentially for the purposes of offending. So the results so far are focused on, on violent and, and criminal activity among individual OMCG members. Um, but one of the main reasons that law enforcement have intensified their focus on OMCGs has been a perception that their members are, are becoming more involved in, in serious and organised forms of crime, and that the gangs themselves are also playing a greater role in directing and facilitating this activity, um, where previously members were engaging in crime largely on their own initiative. Um, so if we go back to the results presented earlier, we see that uh, about a third of OMCG members, as I said, um, have recorded instances of, of ongoing criminal enterprise offending or organised crime type offending. Um, and, and looking further at that, around a quarter have recorded instances of drug supply offending. Um, and if we focus on recent offending specifically, we see that about 10% of, of OMCG members have um, each of these types of offences recorded. Now, this is significant and it's important to know on its own, but it doesn't really tell us how members are engaging in offending. Um, it doesn't really tell us whether they're doing so with other OMCG members um, or whether they're doing so um, on their own. And it doesn't really tell us whether they're engaging in this offending um, on, on, the, on the direction of their gangs, um, which are operating as, as criminal organisations. So to begin to answer this question, um, let's first look at the prevalence of offending across OMCG chapters. Um, so this figure here shows the proportion of chapters that had at least one member um, with recorded recent offending, both overall um, and of different types. Now, if we focus specifically on the um, organised crime type offending, the ongoing criminal enterprise and the, and the drug supply offending, um, we can see that, that around half of OMCG chapters in Australia include um, at, least at least one member that have, uh, has been involved in this um, organised crime type offending. Um, so even though the recent prevalence rates of these types of offences are around 10% for members, which might seem quite low, 
um, their rates are substantially higher among chapters. Um, and this suggests that the membership of many chapters um, includes at least a small number of members who are engaging in organized crime. Now that being said, there's a fair degree of concentration within chapters um, similar to members. So looking at our Lorenz curve here, um, which looks at the concentration in, in different kinds of offending across OMCG chapters, we can see that around 5% of OMCG chapters in Australia accounted for around about a third of um, offences generally and of violent offences specifically. Um, but crucially, they accounted for around um, half of the organised crime uh, type offending um, that, that's occurring in Australia as a result of this population. So while many OMCG chapters in Australia include at least one member engaged in organised crime, um, there are a few chapters that include uh, many members and there that are potentially accounting for a, a disproportionate um, amount of this, uh, of this form of offending. So to cap this examination off, um, we used a methodology developed by international researchers uh, to examine the extent to which OMCGs are likely to be operating as criminal organisations. Um, now this methodology classifies an organisation as criminal based on the extent to which its office bearing and non office bearing members are engaged in organised crime uh, individually. So a, a high percentage of both office bearing and non office bearing members within a given gang um, would indicate that that gang is, is um, more likely to be operating as a criminal organisation and not just as a, a group of individuals who are engaged in organised crime on their own. Um, so the scatter plot here um, plots all OMCGs in Australia with at least one office bearer based on the proportion of office bearing and non-office bearing members with recent ongoing criminal enterprise offences. Um, and we also distinguish between gangs who have um, uh, four or more or fewer than four office bearers um, for ease of interpretation. Um, now, if we look just at those larger gangs who have four or more office bearers, we can see that 11 of these gangs um, had at least one office bearing and non-office bearing member who had recorded ongoing criminal enterprise offences um, uh, against them. Um, and in addition to that, um, if we narrow our, narrow our focus further, um, we can see that in eight of these gangs, um, uh, more than 10% of office bearing and non-office bearing members had recent ongoing criminal enterprise offending recorded. Um, now, this is likely to be a conservative estimate. Um, when we look at overall offending instead of just recent offending, and I haven't presented the results here, um, but when we, when we looked at overall offending or overall ongoing criminal enterprise offending, um, all gangs with four or more office bearers um, had at least um, one office bearing and one non-office bearing member um, with ongoing criminal enterprise offences recorded. Um, so what this really suggests is that there, there may be, um, or there is likely to be some degree of structural involvement um, in, in organised crime activity among a number of uh, Australia's um, outlaw motorcycle gangs. Um, so to cap things off, um, what have these results told us about uh, the criminal activity of OMCGs in Australia? Um, well, first of all, they've told us that, that crime is highly prevalent among OMCGs and their members and becomes even, um, I guess, starker when we compare these uh, figures with other, uh, other populations. Um, so they're, they're quite comparable in terms of the prevalence of their offending to, to international populations of OMCG members. Um, and importantly, they, they appear to be um, more prevalent in their offending than other populations of offenders um, along with the general population. Um, uh, additionally, the, the, the population of OMCG members seems to be growing more criminal and violent as a number of uh, younger uh, men who are more criminally and violently um, inclined uh, join these gangs. And finally, there's evidence of a notable degree of organised crime involvement um, among OMCGs um, and critically, some emerging evidence of the structural involvement of uh, some OMCGs in this activity. Um, now, while these, result, while these results present a, a picture of OMCGs as a highly criminal population, um, we need to remember that, that not all in the population are committing crime equally. Um, so there was also a substantial variation across members um, and, and groups in terms of the, the nature and degree of their offending and, and critically a significant concentration in a small number of members and groups who are accounting for a disproportionate amount of the crime um, and the harm caused to the community. Um, now, these results uh, obviously are, are critical to addressing the first of the two aims of our program of research um, here at the AIC into OMCGs, um, but they also contribute in some ways to the second of these aims as well around informing and examining responses. So I'd like to finish things off by looking a little at, at how those results do that. Um, so broadly, these results paint a picture of OMCGs as a, a significant and growing um, crime threat. 
um, justifying the intensified uh, law enforcement focus um, here in Australia. Um, they also provide some evidence for the growing role of gang structures in, in facilitating and, and uh, coordinating or potentially facilitating and coordinating organised crime activity, um, which further research um, examining co-offending among OMCG members and the structures of, of OMCG criminal networks can build on. Um, and finally, they uh, really point to the importance of identifying um, and, and targeting these prolific uh, individual members and groups who are accounting for a disproportionate amount uh, of the crime and the crime-related harm. And to these ends, the, um, the Serious and Organised Crime Research Laboratory are, are currently undertaking a number of uh, further research projects to better understand, um, first of all, to better understand and improve risk assessment processes for OMCGs um, in order to improve our ability to um, uh, ideally preemptively identify and target these, uh, these prolific individuals and groups. Um, uh, we're also in the early stages of um, uh, uh, understanding the um, organised crime business models that, that OMCGs adopt in order to, to better um, inform efforts to disrupt these. Um, uh, we're in the early stages of examining the impact of certain legislative and regulatory uh, measures focused on um, uh, inhibiting or, or, or blocking the, the ability of OMCGs and their individual members to engage in organised crime. Um, and we're just in the process of uh, finalising um, and releasing some research to inform uh, measures uh, to prevent men from joining OMCGs and also to encourage and facilitate, facilitate those who want to leave to do so. Uh, so that um, brings us to the end. Now to reiterate, the, the results presented here have come out of the first wave of uh, research um, that we've undertaken here at the AIC in the Serious and Organised Crime Research Laboratory. Um, some of which has been released, um, some of which is soon to be released. Um, over the next year or so, we're, we'll also be uh, releasing some additional studies um, addressing many of the points that, that I've discussed at the end there. Um, so for those who are interested, please do watch this space and keep an eye out on uh, our website at arc.gov.au um, as that uh, research starts to come out. Thank you.